Leaving a Legacy is brought to you by HipstersOfTheCoast.com and can be found on the Top Deck app every Friday. You can support the show directly at Patreon.com slash Leaving a Legacy. Magic is power. Welcome to another episode of Leaving a Legacy. My name is Patrick. I'm your Legacy Newbie. And with me this week, as always, is not Jerry Me. Unfortunately, our buddy is feeling a little under the weather this week. Uh, so I have a great guest on, and I will be introducing them in just a moment. But I wanted to do a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, housekeeping stuff, um, thank our newest patrons and all that. So uh, first and foremost, I wanted to shout out our newest patrons uh, we got in the last uh, week or so, uh, Oliver... Voegli? Vo- Vogeli. Al- Oliver Vogeli. I think I did pretty well with that last name. And uh, Daniel K. Hall, um, uh, our buddy Bobo Fraggles, uh, both new patrons. Uh, so thank you for joining the Patreon family, of course. Uh, it's a huge support for the show. And uh, if you want to support the show directly, you can visit Patreon dot com slash leaving a legacy um other than that uh we don't have too much else going on um i did want to shout out uh our buddy travis and all his uh all his buddies over the legacy pit Uh, apparently they have a uh major announcement uh he said it may spark some of our interests uh, in the legacy scene um he said it is, the news is coming this Saturday, so you can check out uh, the Legacy Pit Twitch channel and their Facebook page, I'm sure, for all that, that information. I have not gotten any information on what's going on, um, but uh, but yeah, so uh, I guess he has some big news for us, uh, for, the, for the Legacy scene in general, for the Legacy Pit, so uh, check that out if you're interested. Uh, I know I will be checking it out myself, and uh, we're looking to have Travis and maybe some of his buddies on in the, uh, in the coming weeks for an episode, so uh, keep your eyes peeled for that. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce our guest. Well, I am here with uh, our friend David, but better known as SK Altered. How you doing, man? I'm doing good. Happy yeah, to be here. Yeah, glad to have you. Again, sorry sorry, Jerry couldn't make it. He is feeling a bit under the weather, so we are forging on without uh, him. Uh, you know, audacity and audio audio uh, quibbles, you know, in the past. So we, I think we're good to go, man. I'm, I'm pretty excited for this one. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, it's uh, we're gonna we're gonna make it. We're gonna make it. Work. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, all right. So, uh, you had kind of come to us with the idea of doing a, an episode about altars, and that's something actually. Uh, I don't know if Jerry and I discussed it on the podcast, but I remember after we did an episode with um, with uh, Dakota, um, we we had kind of showed her a few of the Klug altars, who is like you know really like I think like just a, a great example of like the you know how good altars can really be. He does a phenomenal job. Um, and we just kind of said, oh, you know, it'd be kind of cool to do an altars episode. And we we sort of just kind of left it at that. And we never really got got around to talking about it again. And uh, you had messaged us recently and said, hey, like, if, you know, I'm just going to throw it out there. If you guys want to do an episode on altars. And Jerry and I are all about it. So uh, I definitely want to talk about that today. But the first thing I want to do is kind of get a sense of sort of, you know, kind of who you are as a person. And especially, like, you know, how did you get into magic? Like, did you get into magic as a player originally? Or was it an art thing for you? How, how did you get into the game? I definitely got into it as a as a player first, and mm-hmm. uh, it's very very happy to be here and happy to talk about my experiences in the game and especially uh, especially altars and the art side is probably where I have a bit of chops because I can't mm-hmm. say I can't say it's the play results. <laughs> <laughs> but um well that's okay i mean you know i'm on the cast so having having good results is not a prerequisite to, to uh to be on the podcast so that's always a good thing <laughs> yeah for sure <laughs> um but i i, I remember I, I got into magic at an urza block and i have like an mm-hmm. incredibly vivid memory of cracking this first box of urza saga and i just it's weird because I remember it being a box. It's like, who starts the mm-hmm. game with a box? Like, I'm pretty sure I must have had a card before then or, like, seen people with yeah. cards. But, like, this was the new set. It had just come out. And I, th- I, th- I think I remember the way Urza's armor looked. It was really cool. I don't mm-hmm. know. And, like, the first rare I pulled was Gamble. And I was like, wait, but, like, okay. you have to... You can discard the one you search for <laughs> yeah yeah yep. <laughs> i was very disappointed <laughs> but um i you know i was really taken and was i think like a lot of people i 
I then I kind of took a break from the game, you know, for for quite a while. I think mm-hmm. I think it was probably when the modern card frame came out. Um, mm-hmm. I you know I I wasn't playing so much in high school and certainly in college, and I, I remember coming back. And, you know, playing a game with my old cards with a friend and seeing this new frame being very confused about, Mm -hmm. you know, whether these were magic cards. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, And then there was just an extremely long break. And in 2016, I was staying with a friend in Philadelphia. I have an artist, so I was doing out Mm -hmm. there doing a show and said, you know, like we've been playing, we've all been playing this game. Yeah. It's like magic. And I was like, oh yeah, I used to play that. And I saw a Land of War Elves. And mm-hmm. I was like, Land of War Elves. Like, I remember this. Like, I, rem- I remember yeah. this so clearly. Yeah, yeah. And um, at this point, like, he no longer plays magic. And like, mm-hmm. I'm like, you know, five legacy decks in. You know? <laughs> <laughs> of course. I was like, oh yeah. Like, I also, I remember the other reason I stopped playing because I was really into it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it does it does get it does happen yeah. man like it's, like when i started it it was uh similar like it, well, you know i was i was pretty young i was probably you know 10 maybe 10 years old maybe 11 uh when i first got into magic and uh i think tempest it was like around tempest or rice age or i think it was tempest right around that time because i remember opening a lot of tempest starter decks and um yeah when i came back to the game in 2014 14 uh, around 2014 i don't know if the new card frames are out yet maybe they were i can't work to- i think because didn't they come out in m15 like uh magic uh like the course at 2015 is that when they redid the card frames that, that, that will be in my black yeah period. so i'm trying to remember but i do remember coming back and <laughs> yeah. playing an fnm and, and yeah. playing against a planeswalker and having no idea what a planeswalker card was because oh, yeah. i had been out of it for so long so i had a very similar kind of uh jolting experience getting back into like tournament play but um so how old were you when you when you cracked that first box of urza that's a good question i i mean i, I was definitely young enough that i also remember the carpet yeah <laughs> yeah you know i was probably what what year was urza block I was probably 2000, 10 or 11 2001 like i think that. maybe I'm trying to think oh uh, well i was a little older than that then i feel like it was earlier than that maybe like 98 oh uh, was it that early Hold on, now, now I have to look it up. Let's see. Oh, yeah, now it looks like 99. Urza's Destiny released 99, and that was the second oh, or yeah, third that was, set, I think. That was second yeah, one, for so sure. Yeah, so Urza's Saga was Vivid the first, memories right? of that. I remember Urza's Saga being like, it, it was amazing. The cards were mm-hmm. super cool. And then Urza's, Dest- Urza's Legacy and Urza's Destiny was like, these yeah, guys are busted. Saga like, was 98, so... I was definitely playing before yeah. Urza's Saga was out. So that's, yeah, that's crazy. Um, so so you got back into the game, right? You, you've built a couple of legacy decks now. And I know you said you had done, I, I think I actually even remember, I don't, did you post your Zimbardment thing on the source or was it on the, the subreddit? I did, okay. I did. The, the source was my, I love mm-hmm. the source. There's the, like, for me, that was a big introduction to legacy and learning about the format and, just reading really old tournament reports mm-hmm. and uh, the 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 way in which people related to each other through card choices and expressed themselves with their decks and the allegiance to the identity of their play style it was all so much a part of what made Legacy so much better than any of the other mm-hmm. formats. And the source was kind of emblematic of that. Totally, for me. yeah. And the zom- there was this there was this zombardment thread, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I loved hanging out in there. It was just. It was just not a deck people yeah. played, you know, Bloodgast and, and Lingering mm-hmm. Souls. That was, Lingering Souls was the thing. Um, and I went to Eternal Weekend for the first time in 2018. And I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to bring Zombardment. Like this is, the, like I had, I had other mm-hmm. decks. Like I'm pretty sure at the time I had Rug Delver and Sneak and Show. And which was the first deck I built in Legacy, but I never really. By the time I really understood how to cast Brainstorm, I wasn't playing Sneak and Show anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, sorry, sorry, Jerry's not here. To, I know, uh, I'm sure you had some, he'd you had have something to say about that. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> but 
And my sneak and show deck's so weird looking because was, I was trying to trade into all of my legacy mm-hmm. cards for my old, like mostly extended block cards. Um, <laughs> but so I, I would ha- I had like everything's mismatched in the deck mm-hmm. in sneak and show. And it's like I have like one foil grizzle brand, like two two from different sets, one non foil. But I still have them. It's like every once in a mm-hmm. while I break it out. Um. But Zombardment just really captured my imagination, and Deathrite Shaman had been banned. And I guess Rug Dover was really popular because Deathrite was banned, and I had Rug Dover because I played Rug Dover during the Deathrite mm-hmm. era because Underground Seas were too expensive. <laughs> and then they took this massive plunge after the Deathrite Yep, ban. yep, I remember that, yeah. Um, but suddenly Rug Dover wasn't as fun because it wasn't the weird deck that no one mm-hmm. played. Um, and Zombardment became sort of possible again and you know i had never gone to a big legacy tournament or in certain i never traveled for a tournament that was another thing that um i listening to your mm-hmm. cast and hearing you talk but i i am sure that the um I, i'm pretty sure the sandwich drop report is uh that, that was niagara i believe oh, yeah so this is after it was like you know, just hearing hearing about, like, the pleasures of traveling for Magic was really something that captured my imagination. Yeah. It's like, this game is really fun. It it connects you with a, a sense of joy mm-hmm. in, in competition, but also in community. And you, you can't pretend that if you're playing Legacy, you're, you're eking out value. Mm-hmm. That's, come on. Yep. <laughs> it's like, like, how much, like, this is, like... It, it was nice that, like, as a as an adult who was doing this as a hobby, I appreciated that um, there was a sense of fun, and it wasn't just about, um, as I said, the kind of grinding mm-hmm. value. Um, although I appreciate, you know, careful mm-hmm. play too. And uh, Eternal Weekend was like an amazing expression of that. And I remember the the <laughs> I played in a I guess it was like a preliminary event that you could win a buy mm-hmm. in in and it was a five rounder and i played against sneak and show i want to say four times and i went undefeated a five oh <laughs> like zombardment yep. this was this was this was pre veil of summer and zombardment at that point ran four thought seas four cabal mm-hmm. therapy or at least my zombardment mm-hmm. ran four thought seas four cabal therapy i also ran i believe i ran three in yep. tomb so it frequently in tune for therapy. Yeah. And then I also had a sideboard Chains of Mephistopheles <laughs> and an Ensnaring Bridge and Lily. Oh, and nice. Yeah. So it just had like a total, like, obviously they can turn one and you don't mm-hmm. play Force of Will. But in a lot of ways, it was a total nightmare matchup mm-hmm. for Sneak and Show. And like after after doing, you know, surprisingly well with a tier three deck, I, I, you know, I was yeah. hooked. And and took took the uh you know was trying to you know really play play my best game yeah. in the tournament and uh started off pretty hot and then you know kind of kind of kind of yeah. petered out as the as the players yep, got yep. better. Yep, yep, it does happen. <laughs> it does happen. It gets tougher and tougher unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I th- I remember I think it was day 2 I saw you know I'd been seeing you know, this there's this storm player who was really mm-hmm. crushing it, which you know was obviously mm-hmm. Cyrus. And I, I met I met him in the area like outside of the event. And I was like, Oh yeah, it's like it's like, Oh, I've been seeing you crushed on Storm, that's great. And he's like, Oh, what are you playing? I was like, Zombardman. He's like, Oh nice. <laughs> like uh like a good Yeah, movie. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um But that that was amazing. And after that I you know, I really Going, returning to Eternal Weekend and planning to travel for Magic again was something I really wanted to do. And I started thinking about, you know, if you're traveling for an event, you're putting in all this energy. And I think like a lot of players who are a bit older, I don't get a chance to play as much as I do to think about enjoying yeah, the game. Yeah. And like like how your deck looks, can also, in addition to what it is, can be an expression of your mm-hmm. enjoyment. And I think one of the things I did was... I tried to get. I was trying to get four and black border duels for mm-hmm. Zombardment, which um, when none of them were blue, and back then was difficult, yep. but seemed like obtainable yep. potentially. Um, 
And then by the 20, I guess the next year, 2019, you know, people were playing Hedron Crab, Hogak had come out. Instead of being a deck that no one played, it was actually, well, the deck was no longer called Zombardman. It didn't play Goblin Bombardment. It was a Hogak mm-hmm. deck. And uh, it also played Underground Sea, so FBB was mm-hmm. out for me. <laughs> Um, and I was thinking about different ways of, um, you know, express, ex- expressing myself mm-hmm. through the deck. And I think some, somewhere, somewhere in between there, I started painting these altars and looking into the history of that, which was also something you could see on these message mm-hmm. boards. So you said you have a, a background in art. Did you go to college for, for, for like uh, fine art and stuff? I did. Yeah. I studied mm-hmm. painting. <laughs> Uh, I do sculpture and other kinds of mm-hmm. art as well, and I got an MFA in art. It's, uh, I mean, a graduate degree in art is not uh, it's not directly <laughs> useful for anything, but <laughs> but it but it is an exp- it is an expression of um, <laughs> of yeah. commitment. Yeah, totally <laughs> for sure for sure. Uh, so so you you got into altering cards. Like, how does how do you? I'm interested in kind of like how do you start altering cards? Do you just like pick some cards and just start, you know, working with them? And then obviously you're trying to get like a clientele base and, and you're trying to fund, you know, if not funding trips with it, you know, to make it worthwhile to go to, to events at least, you know, making it worth mm-hmm. your time and like time invested into doing this, right? Because it's it must take a, a significant amount of time to alter a card. It definitely does. For me, like clients, that came mm-hmm. way later. Like the first thing was I just I was going to do it for myself, and I remember it was also about things that didn't mm-hmm. exist but seemed like would be pretty cool, and I always thought I thought the um, the full art John Avon basic, basics mm-hmm. were pretty nice. Um, sorry, to <laughs> like, but like, um, <clears throat> you know they, and it's, it really is so much about the frame. It's not I think that the art in them is actually John Avon's particularly mm-hmm. best art or particularly interesting landscape art. Like part of what makes for me especially the original unhinged ones look really good is just the way the art sits mm-hmm. in the border. And the fact that the unhinged ones have a the name of the card is centered mm-hmm. on the top mm-hmm. in the text box. And the text box is smaller than mm-hmm. the width of the card. Which is very different from like in the reprints of those lands that are still full art. The frame doesn't look nearly as good, I think. I forget which master set did them, but it just doesn't, you know, it having less border wasn't yeah. necessarily better. And there's something about the way those arts were designed, like, works really well with a rectangle mm-hmm. for me. But I also, for me, as I said, like, the old border, was that was my border. I was very confused. Yeah. You know? So I liked these arts. I thought they were cool. But I, and I kind of wanted the old border. So the first thing I did was I made an, a, I took... A John Avon Mountain, which I think was an Urza Block mm-hmm. one, which makes sense because that's kind of where my roots were. And I always thought it had a really, really nice kind of atmospheric perspective where it's like basically all red and it diminishes as it gets further back. And that's how the depth comes from the mm-hmm. color change. Um, and I turned that into a full art old border mm-hmm. basic where it has the old border, but it goes to a full rectangle and mm-hmm. has no text. And that was, you know, what you would call, in the language of alters now, you'd call right. it an extension, where I extended the original John Avon art, but I also extended the border. And I hadn't seen someone do full full art old border yeah. basics before. So I ended up making a play set of those, just, um, or I guess it wasn't a play set, it was one of each basic. I made, you know, and they weren't mm-hmm. all Avons, like um, the forest was with this Urza Saga forest. They're all ones I particularly liked. I there was this Tempest Swamp that I always thought was yeah. great as a kid, and I went with that. But it's it's you know people have really different opinions yeah. about swamps. <laughs> I love the I love the Tempest Forests. Those are some of my favorite forests. Uh, yeah, they're really oh, really sure. great. Really really great. Yeah. Um, yeah go, and, sorry, go ahead. Well, it's like I'm curious. What what uh what basics do you play with? Do you do you just do basics? Yeah, I do, do, beta. do beta. I actually just picked up my betas when we were in Niagara, actually, which was like the last big event I played at before yeah. uh, the last like big GP I played at, I believe, before before we had COVID. So, um, yeah, I picked up which beta. Uh, so I have the Beta Islands. The uh jeez, I can't remember now. Um, I actually think I have my deck with me, but yeah, it's like uh, see, that's like that's where I'm a little bit beyond my depth is like knowing the art. 
Oh, yeah, but like, is it is, is it the sunset? Is it I the believe sunset so. Island? Yeah, it's like very orangey like in really... the background, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Some some people that they, they swear by the mm-hmm. Sunset Island. Some people they're like, no, like I want their island really. Like, yeah, I mean, I really there. just dig the beta look. Uh, I just think they look just look super cool, and uh, like the old the old yeah. corners look neat, and just having like they are like you know the oldest cards in my deck. Uh, you know, so that that I think it's pretty cool too. Um, I, I mean, I wasn't even playing Magic when Beta was released, so for me, it's like kind of like claiming uh, claiming authority that I don't actually have, but it's still I'm still fine with it. Um, yeah. But one thing, I, yeah, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you was, have you ever had an artist like actually see the alters you do, where like you extend their artwork or anything like that? I'm curious if like you've ever had input, or, you know, or like just kind of interactions you've had. That actually that actually okay. happened, um, and that was. Frankly, it's so small, but it was one of the highlights mm-hmm. of my career mm-hmm. ever altering something. Um, it, I, I may, I altered these Llanowar elves, um, and I, I was thinking about. This is more recently where I've been doing much more complicated alters, and a lot of my alters became full art. You completely mm-hmm. changed the art, and I think there are a lot of great alterists mm-hmm. who do that and who do it in a really, like the. The level of skill mm-hmm. is high, which is something I try to bring to it as well. But I'm also extremely invested in the history yeah. of the game. And so I was trying to think about kinds of altars where it's not just about showing off how cool the new image is. I also want to pay tribute mm-hmm. to the original art. So I made this altar where the Land Worlds, that same art that I remembered when uh, my friend sucked me back in yep. 2016, um, had a new motif but still Mm -hmm. had the border. And so I was thinking about something where instead of extending the original art to just cover either the white or black part of the border or making it a full art where you cover up, in this case it would be the the kind of green Mm -hmm. old border part, what if there was something that was in the border, like the white or the black part, spilled over into the green but didn't completely Mm -hmm. cover it? And so I made, it's like, um, like a floral motif and I did it on a set of Llanowar Elves, and they're based off of actual plants that were in my garden. And there's one, this one, uh, that's a nasturtium. Mm-hmm. I actually have this one here. Um, and this nasturtium plant was growing in my house, or, and um, I made it botanically accurate to it. So I took photos mm-hmm. of the plant and then made a collage of it in Photoshop and then painted it very yeah. realistically, but in a way that shows it's paint onto the card. And this is, I, I actually keep very few of my own altars these days because I do yep. mostly commission. This is one I held on to and I posted it and, um, uh, Jesper Meifers posted on the, on the, on the card, someone who I'm, I'm not friends with on Facebook. I've never met him said like, this is a really oh. nice idea. It's just like very, yeah. sh- sh- and, th- oh, that, that was that's super cool kiss, yeah I, I, can, I can i can imagine well i suppose like if someone alters your art and does like a, an extension they're really doing sort of like a a tribute to the original art uh and you're kind of doing this artwork on the borders and that's pretty cool too but so i guess both of those can be like kind of very like uh tributary you know kind of things um uh, honoring the artist but then you do like you also do ones where you ch- totally change the art too right Oh yeah, for sure. A lot, a lot of, a lot of pieces like completely mm-hmm. change the art, and um, there are many different approaches. You usually want to leave the, mm-hmm. the title, the converted mana cost, and then depending on the card, you may or may not want to leave the text box or some other element. And there, um, but the most important items in an altar are the title and the converted yeah. mana cost. Um, and so sometimes I'll, I'll do a piece and it'll be completely different. One of the, one piece that I did recently that I really enjoyed was a, uh, a time walk that was smoked. It was a collector's mm-hmm. edition piece for an old school player, uh, where collector's edition is something that's pretty mm-hmm. commonly played in the, except in Swedish rules, but, uh, um, it was in pretty bad shape and the altar was a way of restoring it and, the, he asked for the cover to Back to the Future 2. Hmm. And I did my very best to put exactly the cover to Back to the nice. Future 2 <laughs> yeah. on this time walk. 
and I painted it so you could see the converted mana cost. You could see the, the words time walk, and I painted right up to the letters. And the text box, I, I wanted to leave the, it's a very short mm -hmm. rules text. Um, so I wanted to leave it, but there was a lot of extra blue and a lot of the smoke damage extended into it. So I created a shrunken yeah. text box. And the rest of it is just this image of Back to the Future 2, which is sweet. It's got the, the flying DeLorean. And it's a it's a really cool image because it also, it, it speaks to, I think, a time period like this mm -hmm. particular movie, which is nostalgic mm -hmm. for a lot of people. And that kind of poster, the same artist who made that poster, he did the poster oh. for Star Wars. And, and oh, Indiana that makes sense, Jones. right? Because that's all those are and all Luke. Made, yeah, yeah. And they're made in a very particular way. Yeah, yeah. All all those, and they're made with oh. airbrush. Um, and they're they're large. You know, they're made the size mm -hmm. of the poster, so it's very rendered. And you know, I do primarily I use uh, re like a regular brush. All my altars mm -hmm. are acrylic paint. Um, but for this piece, I also brought in a little bit of the airbrush as a way to really. Um, get the sense of the mm. style of this artist because it's not for me it's not about trying to make it as realistic as possible which is something that I could do but it it's all it's it's about trying to capture the spirit of the particular image that yeah you know, has a feeling to it you know it's like your time walks yeah. back to the future that is pretty awesome, awesome. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so is is that the most expensive card that you've altered um no, I the I did a time twister before that, um, and I am working on an unlimited Whoa, Mox Pearl wow. right now, and an and a, a English Legends Tavern. Whoa, oh yeah, yeah. It's pretty high up so, there too, and uh, English Abyss. Like uh, people, you know, when when you've when you've done cards and know mm -hmm. how to handle them and show mm -hmm. that you can handle them. And treat them with yeah. a lot of respect. I think people end up developing trust yeah. in what you do. So, so you have, uh, you said you have uh, obviously multiple projects going at once. Like, do you prefer to have like to work on different things simultaneously, or are you going to say like, "All right, I'm working on this abyss right now, and this is the only thing I'm working on until it's finished. I see it through." That's a good question. I think as far as being an an, an altruist who takes on clients and works in the mm -hmm. professional sphere. I'm relatively new to the game, and I take it very seriously, but I'm still learning. And I think, ideally, I would like to take take on a small number of pieces and then deliver them in a very predictable time mm -hmm. back to the clients. I think the truth of the matter is that currently I've taken on a few more mm -hmm. than I would have, and I, my, my commissions are currently on hold because I have a queue of people who are waiting for mm -hmm. the pieces to be done. There actually is a strong advantage to having a couple of pieces going at once. I think it's actually really healthy and ends up being a better mm -hmm. work for all of them. But yeah. there's a limit. You don't want to you like two to four pieces at once is yeah. really really good because um, making an altar um, incredibly thin so that you can't feel it in a sleeve and it, your deck mm -hmm. won't cut to it um, requires painting very with mm -hmm. very dilute paints and patience to dry gotcha. between layers. Um, which is kind of counterintuitive, but it's the sort of thing that um, I think people in the community have mm -hmm. learned over time, but was was not the sort of thing people started right. with at first. Yeah, because I've definitely seen altars where like the the paint on them. I mean, I've seen them. You know, people post them on like the the magic subreddits or whatever, and they're super they're like people's first yeah. go at it, and the paint is like looks like my kids acrylic paints they might use for like you know a day a day in the yeah. uh and, you know, a rainy day or whatever and they're like super chunky and bleeding and kind of bleeding all over all over the place and and just you know they, they end up covering a lot of like the 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 name of the card and it just ends up looking i mean i i just think i think <laughs> altering cards is incredibly difficult because the the medium is so you know it has such tight constraints and it's also like pretty small like a like a magic card is not a large like piece to do art, to make art on you know especially if you're if you're only yeah. altering a border you're only altering like you know a text box like that's even smaller it's not even like you have the whole card to work with so yeah it's uh it must be quite difficult yeah the the mini the miniature side of it is it's something that over time you mm -hmm. get used to, and it has its pleasures, but it's it can get pretty crazy too. You're, 
especially because um, I think for in in my work and I think for other altruists who tend to focus on like single more involved mm-hmm. pieces rather than you know play sets or just kind of simple extensions we, there's a it's pretty common to do digital mock-ups so I might do a digital mock or say oh yeah I'm gonna get all of this mm-hmm. in and so far I've never done a digital mock-up where I can't mm-hmm. realize it on the card but there's suffering yeah. in between yeah. sometimes <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I'm like oh like I can right, zoom right. in Photoshop I can get <laughs> yeah. really close yeah <laughs> but like on the card like no it it it's right. the size it is, and um, it takes experience to be able to do things precisely yeah. at that small scale. But it's also it's really fun to be able to do it and something satisfying. So, t- can you tell right. me about like what kind of paints you use to, to alter cards with? Is it like is it always like oil? Pa- is it oil paints? Is it acrylic paints? Like, I don't know anything about paint, but I'm just curious. Yeah, for me, I I use uh, acrylic okay. paints always. Um, I actually use oil paints mm-hmm. in other kinds of art. Uh, and it, there are a small number of people who have altered mm-hmm. with oil paints. Um, I think notably Steve Argyle used to, if people wanted to commission, like mainly he just would do sure, yeah. it over and over <laughs> yep, again. Yep, yep. <laughs> and there was like the highest tier was where he'd do an yep. oil painting on it. Um, but And there, there are some altruists who work in oil, and it, it can mm-hmm. be very beautiful. It is not not gonna last really? in the long run. Is it just because they take so like oil like just doesn't dry super well? Is that why or? No, I mean oil does mm-hmm. take a long time to dry. You can put things in it that will change it. Like the traditional is called mm-hmm. demar varnish. More recently, people use something called galkid. Um, but the thing is, oil paint, oil. Think about like mm-hmm. olive oil in a bottle. It starts out like yeah. it's liquid. Say you. You're at a pizza place. The olive oil, olive oil bottles like been like mostly empty for like two months, and no one's refilled it. It's like kind of mm-hmm. sticky. Imagine it goes the extreme of that, like six, like six years, no one's done it. What happens is oil paint becomes rigid, hard, mm-hmm. like glass. And what will happen is if you have something that's like glass on top of something that bends like cardboard yeah. slightly, you know, you're flicking your cards sure, annoyingly, yeah, yeah. you know, you're like a air control player. <laughs> yeah, <so. yeah. laughs> What will happen is you'll get these crackles. Like on old oil paintings in the museum, mm-hmm. you'll see a crackle mm-hmm. effect on the front. And that's because the canvas has a certain amount of flexibility. So it is possible to do it on cards, but there's a risk that the bending of the cards will make gotcha. the paint flake off. And acrylic paint nat- is a polymer. You know, the, it's the nature of the molecule. It's the nature of the paint. So it, it's just inherently much more flexible. And it, it, it should stay on yeah. the card really well if yeah. applied properly and applied huh. really thinly. And so for that reason, gotcha. I always use acrylic. Gotcha. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Can you tell me about like the how difficult it must be? Incredibly difficult. To, I was just thinking like just to paint around like the text of a card, like the the name of a card. Is that like that? Yeah. Uh, I see some of the altars that are done in there, like super precise, and it makes you think like how how are you doing that? That must be incredibly painstaking. That's one that really mm-hmm. comes with practice. Um, I think when you start out, it. It might be intimidating, uh, but it it ends up you realize like you get so close mm-hmm. to the cards when you do this, <laughs> and I spend yeah. a lot of time with them. And there's certain things where the actual printing of the ink sits on the card in a certain way, and when you push your paint up against that mm-hmm. very carefully, if you're extremely familiar with how the paint flows, it will it'll kind of rest on the ink that's printed as huh. a boundary and can fit really precisely. And that's something that can only come with yeah. a lot of practice, but you, you get a sense of that. Um, and so it's about precision, but it's also about really carefully mm-hmm. looking at the cards. And um, I think it's kind of cool. It's like it actually made me better at evaluating card yeah. condition after. Yeah, I mean, you, you're you're definitely getting up close and personal with these things, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. So. Um, no, I know we we kind of had like a really rough outline. Uh, we've sort of gone not off the rails, but we've gone a little deeper into like uh, into altering itself because it, it is really, a, I think, a fascinating thing. And like like you said, we've seen altars that are done that you've seen some that are like kind of not so great, and then you see some that are really just just mind blowing. Um, so tell me a little bit about like you know 
like who comes to you to do altars? Like are are people generally doing altars like for an entire deck mm. or are they do they and do people come to you with like an idea of exactly what they want or it's like more collaborative? You know, are they doing like a single piece? So like I said, it's part of an entire deck that's all altered. What do you see out there? Yeah, you know, you see all of those things, um, and and but often mm-hmm. from different people. Um, I think um, sometimes I'll get a, a, like a frequent, you know, kind of call or email or message would be from a client who is already invested in getting their cards pimped mm-hmm. out in different ways. They have a deck that's partly altered, and when you go for the kind of most elaborate altars. It's extremely uncommon to have an entire deck by mm-hmm. a single altruist. Um, there are some exceptions, but it's it's pretty rare because um, it could be minimum ten hours for an elaborate card, but could easily wow. be forty. Um, and they get you know it gets yeah, pretty expensive, yeah. and also, um, especially for people kind of at the top of the field, they want to do different things. There's a real if you if you're repeating yourself mm. too much, mm-hmm. there's a real burnout mm-hmm. factor, um, because it, it's something that can only happen if yeah. you're passionate about it. Um, I think that's that's why people do such cool art that's you know, yeah. for cards we play with. Um, so collectors of altars or people who you know want to really give their deck the treatment will uh, go to different artists or build it over a years long project, like someone doing you know. If someone wants their whole deck in mm-hmm. Korean foil, right? Like one of the rarest languages to get, mm-hmm. Russian foil. And, you know, some people, they have the whole deck finished. It's done. But for many people, it's a project over right. time to get it. I know yes, you, yeah, you do Japanese yeah. yep. foils. Right, yeah. It's, it, yep. it's a project. And some it's amazing when you get it. And some it's very satisfying when you see yeah, someone who's completed yeah. it. Um. And then there, there are some people where actually the altars come from filling gaps in kind of the aesthetic desire and other things. I think that's more mm-hmm. common in Legacy than in almost any other format where uh, in Legacy people want to play their cards and they want them to be approved by a judge right. in a sanctioned tournament. And I have to say, and just you know, for any listeners wondering about altars, I can't, and no other altars could ever guarantee right. that they will be approved. It is always at the discretion yeah. of the head judge, um, and I'm not a judge, so I can't even speak with full authority to what um, what the basis mm-hmm. for those decisions are. Um, I've had my altars played consistently at um, competitive mm-hmm. REL events, but that doesn't that doesn't mean that's right, depends right. on the judge. Um, and you really you want to have the name visible and the converted mana cost. And if the art is no longer recognizable, you won't mm-hmm. have the rules text. And even then, yeah. it's more challenging. So for legacy players, a common thing will be like, oh, this card doesn't even exist in this version. Can you alter yeah. it to make it yeah. exist? And that was something yeah. I thought was so cool. It's like a tribute to the game. It's a tribute to the history. So there's one alterist who I think is pretty well known for being able to for switching languages, which is something that mm-hmm. I do a little bit. But I really the pioneer of this is a person. His name is Kyle, but it goes yeah, with yep. alters. And amazing mm-hmm. stuff, right? He can switch out the language of a dual land to make yes, it look like Yeah, Japanese. they're really fantastic. And that are really fantastic. And it's something that he, he's very generous. He's open mm-hmm. about how he does it, but there are very mm-hmm. few people who can do it. And I'm, I'm working for a client who has an incredible painter deck. It is, yeah. it is exquisite. It's all Japanese. It's mm-hmm. all old border. His preference is yep. non-foil, and for years he had these FBB duels, and like, well, it's like, what about? He's like, maybe mm-hmm. I should switch to beta, like, you know, maybe like I really want to do. It. And I was like, well, you know, I could if you get unlimited, I can make those Japanese beta bordered unlimited with full art, yeah. but with the beta yeah. border. Some like that's a project wow. I'm working on now, where it's it's really about mm-hmm. the client's deck and having that deck be complete and that's someone yep. in the legacy space yep. who's doing something like that and it's really a that's pleasure super to work cool with another kind of planner mm-hmm. people do cubes and the cubes that's where you get some of them right yeah yeah because you because you don't have to worry about them being term or legal you can really pay, do any, anything you want to the car right because they're never going to see the light of day outside someone's home right so yeah yeah absolutely 
Um, one of the first altars I did for myself mm-hmm. was a Delver. I made a full art Delver, full art full side, front side, full art back side. And I like that because it's a, because it's on a checklist card. I never had to worry about that. Right, the right. Video. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And it was just like that was right at when I was starting to alter, and I you know, wasn't as confident mm-hmm. as I am now that. And honestly, this the smoothness on that's excellent too. But it just uh, you know you get more experience and you realize certain things work mm-hmm. and certain things don't. And um, you know, it, I, it just it feels really nice to play with a card that you know. Yeah, is just yeah, yours. totally. <laughs> no, I mean I I like you said I, I get that satisfaction when I'm playing like my you know my Japanese Blue or Delver deck and like. I know, like, I remember picking up my, you know, FBB Japanese lightning bolts, you know, when I was in Niagara. I remember, like, exactly, like, seeing those and, like, I had just, I was about to drop out of the tournament. I think I had one more, one more game left in me and I saw those and I'm like, I'm picking those up. And I think I ended up trading, like, some, I sold some Liliana the Last Hope or whatever and, like, went over to another booth to pick them up. And I oh. spent, like, I think I spent, like, $20 out yeah. of pocket or something like that. It was, like, it was a great, like, feeling and, like. I sleeved them up and then played my last get match with the new FBB uh, bolts in my deck. And like, it's not a huge pickup, but you know, that's, that's part of the, you know, the completion of the deck or whatever, that aesthetic that you really like that. Yeah. It makes it, it makes playing it so, so much more enjoyable. So that's, that's pretty, do you find that like you, is it mostly like cube and vintage and like, and you know, legacy players that you alter for, or have, have you ever done like alters for modern players? I assume like standard is pretty much out of the question just because, the amount of time. Standard is the one format I like. I I have no I have no knowledge and like no like I don't I don't think I've ever done an alter for someone mm-hmm. who's only mm-hmm. playing. Yeah, because I imagine like by the time you're done with <laughs> um, it, it might have ro- it might be rotated out, you know. So yeah. yeah. But but modern actually, you know, you you get mm-hmm. them in modern for sure. Um, there's certain decks that just have stuck around. Why are cards people really love? that end up being st- like i don't know there's some that are they're just super common i'm working on a mm-hmm. karn liberated um that is a thanos with the, the glove nice. and that's a that's a pretty yeah. common altar and the way i'll put my touch on that is through the, yep. the particular image and trying to make it look really have a kind of drama to it. and for me i really want it mm-hmm. to feel like karn mm. and feel like thanos at the same time i want it to be both not just it's perfectly Thanos right. or it's perfectly Karn. I want it to, to call up the original image. Because um, that's, that's kind of what yeah. I like bringing to it. And so modern, it happens. Um, legacy, legacy definitely, I think it's often people completing mm-hmm. an aesthetic in a deck. Although, I remember, you know, I, at Eternal Weekend, you see them. You see really cool altars. The last round I played, last time I was playing Hogak. And <laughs> I, was pl- I played mm-hmm. against Turbo Depths and I would say 70% of his deck was was altered, Nick, yeah. very extensively altered. It looked amazing. I guess he had gotten the judge to check, it. and that's the thing you do at a Compario event. You present your deck to the judge before them and say, "I got yep. some alters in it. Do you wanna? Can you take a look?" And so I think for a lot of people, if you're really planning on playing a lot of Compario, um, the first alters you might get are cards where. They're not so expensive that you can't right. replace them. Altering dual lands, which is amazing. It's one of you know, it's one of the pinnacles yeah. of altering yeah. alter a dual land. But just because it's so iconic, it's so useful, it's so iconic, mm-hmm. you fetch it up. Mm-hmm. Like what's not to love? But it's not for every player. It's for people who are really confident in in their deck or have a collection yeah. that can sustain that. But it's like you you know you alter uh, an Inquisition of Kozilek or mm-hmm. a, a Ponder. It's you know you can. If if the judge says you can't use it, you can use some right, right. another one. Yeah, um, that's really. And but I'd say a lot of old school players are very really. Big in that's community. that's kind of surprising that, to me actually. Well, the thing is, old school players, you know, it's true. Their decks are mm-hmm. very special, and there's a lot of tribute. You know, pe- the original cards are a huge thing, right? I, if you're playing. Um, Playing a deck yeah. with alpha cards yeah. and beta cards, like the original art's a lot of what it's about. But it's also a community in which, like, the card pool is known. So how you put to your deck together is so <laughs> much a part of it. And you know, you you don't traditionally exchange deck lists that are written out. You mm-hmm. exchange images. So there's also oh, yeah, that, that sense. Where it's like, oh well, yeah. this is this is the card I chose to get. Yeah. This is the way I do it. 
And the altars in the old school community yeah. are amazing. And a lot of people, one thing I think is very cool is I do these altars that are very mm -hmm. involved. They take a lot of time and you know they involve a lot of skill. But there are lots of altars that are awesome in old school where skill is yeah, completely yeah. beside the point. <laughs> <laughs> it is about the, the right. spirit of the thing. And people, I think they, they I, I've, I've grown yeah. to really enjoy that, that ad attitude can carry as mm -hmm. much as anything else yeah, when it comes yeah. to these things. I think, you know, I think yeah, they're like going to sharpie general. a soul, uh, like a beta soul ring. And they're like, yeah, this is just what we're going to do here. No big deal. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> rarely on yeah. beta, but it happens. Um, I, there there is one. Uh, so I've definitely seen one old school player, and I'm trying to remember his name. I think he's from New York City, and I think he always posts like the most wildly altered decks. Uh, when I used to be on Twitter, I used to see him all the time, and I'm trying to remember J Jocko, Jaco, maybe. <laughs> I don't... Oh, Jaco, yeah. J you know, Jaco is one of the people who. Um... He's from New York or Chicago, but he, you know, he he organizes um, the old school event that takes place yeah. at Eternal Weekend, or at least the last couple of years. I, I could be wrong on this, but I mm -hmm. think that I think that's him. And I I got into Legacy before old school, and then you know my friends who were who were staying with mm -hmm. me for Eternal Weekend, like oh you know try this try this format, just innocently. Mm -hmm. Slinging mono black with no power, and then like six months later, I'm looking yeah. at CE cards, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Jaco's deck is amazing. His power nines all all altered. I think it's like the yeah. Green's treasure map, and yeah. they all add together. And what's cool, what's cool is there's also a history where I think the power. If I remember correctly, his power his power includes Time Vault mm -hmm. as power nine, oh, but cool. not Time Twister. Interesting. Because he he was very mm -hmm. early in the altar game, like his like I don't know what year he got those altered, yep. and I think they're unlimited. Um, but it was before it was a common thing, and this is the style of his decks. His demo I remember his demonic tutor is so yep. cool. It's not altered. It's just I don't know whether it's alpha or beta, but it's definitely you know one of those, and it is. It's not it didn't go through the washing machine, but yeah. everything short of that. Yeah. It was so beat up. And it gave me this incredible appreciation for seeing totally. the age on a card. Yeah. A they get like that you know, that like, patina, it's, right? It's like it's I like, mean, I don't know any other word for it, but oh, yeah. it, they're just aged, you know, and they they look that it it's just oh, you know, yeah. when you open up a fresh pack of cards, like you know, like I opened I opened up a box of um Time Spiral Remastered, uh the week it came out or the week after it came out. And like it was super cool opening up like old border true name true name nemesis and old border monastery swift spear yeah and like you know that's super cool but the, what it's missing is like oh like the fifteen years of age or twenty years of age that should be on this card too you know it's like <laughs> I should just let my kids play with these for a while you and get that get the scuff marks on them and you know maybe get a little <laughs> creasing here and there and oh, uh, yeah that yeah, it makes it definitely makes the card feel special when it has a little bit of age on it you know. Rip totally yeah totally <laughs> so so now you had a section on like how to commission an altar and i'm actually kind of interested in this because you know let's say you know i can see i could definitely see myself like because i've actually talked to scourge before uh, I, I had messaged him this was again this was probably before mm -hmm. it was before niagara because i was thinking about getting my volcanics done before yeah. niagara to have them in time um and uh you know we, we were talking about getting them done for then but, but you know how would how would you go about like commissioning an altar like do you you know what, what kind of tips and tricks tricks do you have for people who are listening to the podcast who think like oh like because I could see myself once I get my deck fully in Japanese like definitely like getting a couple of the cards altered to be to fit the way I like you know the way I want them to look especially my you know my revised uh, volcanics I would love for them to look you know to be Japanese like the rest of the deck you know oh yeah. Just to have to have it all perfectly yeah. fit is an incredibly yeah, exactly. satisfying thing. Um, yeah, th there 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 are a lot of ways to go about it, and someone who has no knowledge of it mm -hmm. can do just fine. But I think it actually is probably helpful for both altruists and for people who are interested in getting altruists to think about 
like to know a little bit more about how it commonly works and the different kinds available because there's so many different kinds of altruists and like different kinds of altruists mm -hmm. are right for different people because the price points can be really different um it you know i think when you reach out to someone um it i for me i'll, I'll speak for myself first and then i'll mm -hmm. talk about other kinds of situations for me i love when a client knows what what they're interested in and it doesn't need to be every doesn't need to be everything like you know with the mocks with the mocks mm -hmm. pearl that i'm working on client said i don't care what you do on it you can do anything mm -hmm. with complete carte blanche yeah that's unusual but i can do that like carte yeah. blanche okay I've, yeah i've got something there but you have to have a lot of confidence mm -hmm. in the person to do that i think that's extremely rare because oftentimes if you think you you think you're okay mm -hmm. with anything maybe you're not yeah <laughs> and then that's yeah. actually that's difficult so you want to have clear communication just like any other interpersonal mm -hmm. relation and it's like with uh if you and with uh, another thing for for me is if someone says i want this image on this card that's actually mm -hmm. often very helpful because if you provide a good a reference image and preferably a good quality one like mm -hmm. decent resolution kind of matters because I really try and mm -hmm. make it very faithful. That that can make a big difference. And the thing that I like to do is then I will then make a mock-up of the card and send it back to a client. And they'll see this is mm -hmm. what it would look like. And I I'll say I generally I take a deposit before I make that mock-up. And the reason I do that is because it's actually a lot of yeah. work to make the mock-ups. So I I don't make them. It's not just putting an image on a card from Scryfall right. and sending it back. It's like no, like what works. With this card should it be should mm -hmm. the text be cut mm -hmm. out or should it not should it have the board the same border a different border you know and sometimes the client will specify sometimes they don't care so knowing what you want and then for me the other is if someone wants original illustration mm -hmm. which i can also do un an understanding that that actually takes tremendously more work and this was something when i started out altering I didn't realize how mm -hmm. much more work it was to do that. And there are some altruists who only do original illustration. It's an, it's an amazing thing. It's like getting... I mean, I actually, I think all sure, authors yeah. are unique works of art. That's, yeah. that's just the, the way it works. But I think um, in a, in an illustration that mm -hmm. has no reference image, um, take something else. And for example, Clue, who's by far the best known person in mm -hmm. altruists, does amazing work. He generally doesn't do original works anymore. He prefers to work from reference image and one of the things he said about that I think is really interesting is that he thinks that part of the strength of the medium part of what makes it really powerful is that you see the card and you relate to something mm. in the world outside of it and you get mm -hmm. the power of both mm -hmm. together and I think another person who's a really amazing altruist who's really well known in the old school community Dustin Broussard and he is he's probably done as many or more mm -hmm. dual ends than anyone else he is and in terms of restoring severely damaged cards, yeah. there's no one better. Um, he does primarily original art, possibly only. I'm not, I, I don't know if he does references. I've seen him do some Disney pieces, but he... Um, and th I think he prefers it that way. You, you yeah. get his sensibility in those works. That's part of what part of what you're getting when you commission a brassard. So I would say, no longer talking about just what it's mm -hmm. like working with me, working with an altruist in general... If you know what you want, that's helpful. And then if you want a certain thing, you might want to mm. know who to ask. Because different right. altruists do different things. And if you don't know who to ask, but you know what you want, there are groups and communities that can help. There's a, there are multiple Facebook groups. Um, there are discords. So there's a group called MTG Alters mm -hmm. and Fan Art, I think. There's another one called Professional MTG Alters, both great groups. Um, you could probably ask for references. You know, if you post in the Leave mm -hmm. a Legacy Facebook group, I'm sure people would say, "Oh, I worked with this Alters. Yeah. This person was great, and I, you know, I really liked what I did." If you post it in the Discord, it could be the Discord for. If you have a deck that's popular, you could post mm -hmm. in the Discord for your deck. You know, you could post a my yep, favorite yeah. source. <laughs> Yeah, it's a little quiet yeah. there these days, but it, it you know, sometimes st stuff still goes on. Um, and I guess the last thing I'd say is think about mm. what your budget is, because you can get an altered any budget, but 
depending on what you want, you should have expectations that relate to it because they do take right. a, a lot of time. Yeah, you said anywhere from you know a few hours to a full week, like a full work week to alter a single card is like that's going to require quite a bit of a, sure. a financial investment from the uh, from the client for sure. Yeah, there's there's I think that at these like the really really elaborate alters, it's never going to be a great hourly for the mm-hmm. alterist no matter yeah. what. Even for Klug, who who I think is, is charges substantially yeah. more than anyone else, he's a great reputation and does amazing work. But I think even the hourly there is probably not good. There's so many hours. In I those can't pieces. imagine. I mean, there's so but, some um, of the ones he done he's done like the some of the stained glass pieces are so intricate, and I still am amazed at like how he like how he must use a straight edge in some of those lines. They're so like perfect. It's really it's really impressive. Um, you know it. He does use this. He uses a straight edge, and in some cases, I think when possible, I actually I find it better to freehand, which yeah, is something yeah. he does as well. But for for make for mm-hmm. recreating a text box or making like a sword mm-hmm. or something that needs to be straight, he uses a oh. clear ruler, which is something that I, I just tr- a trick I picked up mm-hmm. from seeing how he does stuff. And it's very I mean, for ultras out there. Yeah. Clear ruler, way better yeah, than I'm one sure. that's not clear. These cards are small. Yeah. You want to yeah. see where you are. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like these little things mm-hmm. that come with experience and it's in there's an interesting balance where if you're working with an altruist who's newer mm-hmm. you might get a better rate because yeah. there is a burnout factor people put so many hours in these things that sometimes some of the best altruists there are incredible people who are doing it near mm-hmm. the beginning of the craft there's a person named Malta Big Up it's one of the it was like he did tons of altars in the uh, mm-hmm. you know 10 years ago and you don't you don't you don't see him doing work anymore because I think mm-hmm. either he moved on to something else or decided it wasn't worth his time. Um, and if you get someone who but if you get someone who doesn't have much of body of work, you might not have as much confidence. Yeah, with yeah, you, yeah, yeah. In what you're gonna get. And you know, I think having having clear communication about what time what the time mm-hmm. frame you need the card in. And for altruists, they should really give clear communication about how long yeah. they think it's going to take which honestly it's not always easy because if you take pride in your work which is something i do and you really want it to be the best mm-hmm. possible thing for your clients sometimes you do something and you think this is going to work you decide no this actually need, you yeah. need to go back to the drawing yeah. board and you add another week or yep. You add yep. or more <laughs> yeah so don't don't get your stuff you know try don't try to get your stuff altered when you have like two weeks out from a tournament basically is what you're saying like you need to be able to part with it for a, a, a certain amount of time for sure Typically, I know with um, with mm-hmm. Kyle Scourge Alters, he he had a very mm-hmm. substantial backlog because I think there was a period where um, his reputation was very strong, but his prices were still reflecting, you know, work. I don't know if I don't know if it really fairly compensated yeah, for yeah. the number of hours in it. And at a certain point, I think he had a very long backlog, and I think he's been working through it, or perhaps has fully worked through it. And he, he wrote and I think communicated really clearly about saying, like, yep. I'm going to raise my prices, which that, yeah. that's what that's absolutely. what you do when yeah. everyone no, wants absolutely. it, right? Yeah. Because you don't ever want to price yourself into having too much work either, you know? You, you have to value your time and your effort exactly. and your skill level in the in what you what you charge, you know? And it has to be worth your time as an artist, I'm sure. And it also, like, you know, it, it is... It's a great way. It's it's just supply and demand, right? It's a great way to thin the people who are potentially buying from you too. If you don't want to have to wade through a bunch of people who want your work, you can just raise your prices slightly, and that kind of weeds out some of the people who are on the fence already, right? So each year I release a mm-hmm. different pricing schedule, and I, you know, I having worked in the um, in the fine art world, I think it's really important not to, you don't want to raise your prices too high. You want just steady growth. That's mm-hmm. what's good for clients mm-hmm. and it's what's mm-hmm. good for artists. <laughs> um, but it, it's the only thing that's fair. It, it, if people want your work and there's a little bit more than you can take mm-hmm. on, you should raise it a little bit and the prices should steadily go up and preferably yeah. they shouldn't go yeah. down. It. But which means you shouldn't raise them too right, high right. to where they're unfair. Exactly. They go yeah. up steady. And like one thing that I do is I try I don't repeat mm-hmm. pieces and that's really good for yes. something that Klug does as well and it's very good for the artist because you don't mm-hmm. lose interest but it's also very good for the client because you get a piece someone else really wants it 
they can't come to me right. and say, oh, can you make that? Can you make a Back to the Future yeah. 2 time yeah. walk? And I'll say, ah, sorry, I didn't do that, but uh, you could, sp- if you want anything, right. try right. to get right. it from yeah. them. <laughs> and it creates, it creates a resale market for, for mm-hmm. high altars at the higher end. Which exist, you know. If you go to a GP, sometimes you'll see yes. altars in yeah. booths. Yeah, I, I was curious. Like, uh, do you have any experience, like, trying to sell cards that have been altered? Like, it must. I'm sure the. It probably depends on the altar too, right? If it's something mm-hmm. super specific, like if it's, if it's a picture of your childhood dog, it might be pretty hard to 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 to, to resell. But if it's something yeah. that is, I guess it makes it interesting, right? Like uh, the the altering you're having done like if you don't if you ever plan on on parting with your cards needs to be you know uh mainstream enough to to for to appeal to other people but also like special (laughs) enough to actually make you want to get the altar done in the first place right so that's an interesting line you have to walk i guess It, it definitely is especially i think it is reasonable to think about like altars they are a personal expression mm-hmm. of enjoyment but part of the fun of magic is a collectible mm-hmm. card game that you trade like well, yeah. trades happen in old school yeah. it's something i love about it it's like people no one you know no one wants to sell their alpha but right they trade right their alpha which is it's not something i participate in personally but i i love to i love, to, I love mm-hmm. to see it happen and it happens with altars too i actually i do as i said i do very few mm-hmm. pieces for myself but I, there's an altruist who I really love in the old school space called, he goes by Quail, and he does these incredible pieces. They're done in pen, and they're mm-hmm. so, they're just amazing. Like they, hmm. they are something else. They got a graphic punch to them, and I would say that the the pieces I'm we're gonna do a trade where I'm mm-hmm. making a piece for him, and I'm getting some altars from him in exchange and he i think i at least at the moment he's not taking commissions because he, he, right, he wasn't enjoying right. doing it for commissions he he you know he he like he does it for the fun of it and people really yeah, want, yeah, want yep. too many you know and but and i'm pretty busy i don't have i'm not able mm-hmm. to do a lot of personal work but the chance to to trade for someone else who's yeah it's super cool yeah it's so cool i'm pretty sure that the pieces that i'm going to get from will not be tournament i'm getting some swords to plowshares i think the violence on them will make them not tournament legal (laughs) that's awesome (laughs) they're based they're kind of like japanese oh very cool that's very cool (laughs) and they're on uh fbb swords to plowshares that's awesome that is awesome um, do you have a favorite altar that you've done or, and, or a favorite altar that you've seen that just is really like, you know, heads and shoulders above, like, you know, either stylistically or the execution of it or, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. Oh boy, that's, that's tough. I don't, I won't, I won't pick a single favorite. That, okay. I'll give you one of each, like one that I've sure. done and one that I love out there in the world, but I won't say it's, that's fair. yeah, that's fair. I mean, yeah, because. I'm 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 such I'm such an omnivore <laughs> when these come to these things. <laughs> just, there I love different things yeah. and different kinds of altars, um, but in I think in my own work, um, I think the, the the time twister that I did yeah. was a really special piece. Um, that was something where part of what made it so special was that the client had a really mm-hmm. wonderful idea. It was a it was a strong idea. He had a vision. He has a very mm-hmm. special mm-hmm. altered deck already, and mm-hmm. uh, he's an old school player. And the his deck, you know, city in a bottle mm-hmm. is a big card in old school. This card, you know, a lot of legacy players might not. Right, not, right. <laughs> not a big player in legacy. It's two two colorless artifact. Right, cards from Arabian Nights can't be played. All cards from Arabian Nights in play mm-hmm. must be sacrificed. Mm-hmm. Something like that. And mm-hmm. but in old school it's insane because all the best yeah. creatures are Arabian, and his city in a bottles are altered to be his home city really? in the bottle. And there's like a mural on a particular building. I forget the, the city wrong. I want to say it's like I say it's mm-hmm. Minneapolis, but I might be getting that yeah. wrong. But it's his home city, and it's got this mural from the city huh. on the city in a bottle, altered by the oh, original artist cool. who did it. He, it was like the artist of sitting in the bottom. Oh, doing the that's altar. pretty sweet. And, and his power is all altered mm-hmm. by Dustin Brassard. They they look exquisite. Um, they are they look like car like carved 
carved pieces and mm. ebony and ivory and they play pay tribute to different parts of the history of the game and i was very you know pleased to have a piece in mm-hmm. this in this place it's like a mm-hmm, it's like a, mm-hmm. his deck's like a museum you know and he came with an idea for the time twister but it wasn't done it was an idea he said i wanted this kind of landscape based off of this mm-hmm. studio ghibli work you know which you know they did these these you know movies like princess mononoke mm-hmm. or spirited away but he was thinking of one that's not as well known called Iblar Jikan. That is these beautiful painted backgrounds that are very lush. Turns out the whole movie existed because the artist hmm. made those paintings, and the movie was based off of these paintings hmm. that existed in the world anyhow. Yeah, so it's like yeah. really about art. He said, "I want I want it to look like this city where it's in all four seasons, and each layer of the city going down hmm. is in a different season. But in the movie, it's like a giant." kind of it's like a mm-hmm. co- conical mm-hmm. mountain like a volcano but for the time push he said can you make it look like an oh. hourglass and so he came with this idea and it was on me to execute it but also had a reference and it fit perfectly yep. with the time twister and i also one thing that i think i particularly enjoy doing and i think i think very few altruists do a lot of this klug does it and he does it very well it's where i you know kind of took my inspiration is altering borders to exactly match mm. an existing border so i made it look like mm-hmm. a full art time twister uh, of this unique image but it involved also replicating the old blue border with that kind yeah. of blue marbleized pattern very precisely and so it was very satisfying to get it to look exactly right and get it to feel as mm-hmm. if it were printed that way perfectly smooth on a piece of power nine and this beautiful deck that yeah. car was in great condition um in terms of other people's altars, I think one piece that always really stuck out to me, and it's just one of the cards that made me think mm-hmm. I wanted to do altars, was this candelabra mm-hmm. Klug did years ago with a, with a skull. It's a Vanitas painting. And seeing this classical work of classical art, but also incorporating mm-hmm. the candelabra art and the way he did it, the level of skill was just amazing. And I think I actually saw someone reselling. It was in a vendor wow. at Eternal Weekend. So I had yeah. seen the altar on the internet and mm-hmm. then I saw it in the vendor and I was like, oh, th- I know this. Yeah. I know this candelabra. Yeah. I know this work of art. And then I saw it and I was like, and I looked at it also and I was looking and I said, yeah. This is early Klug. Like Klug has gotten of course, everyone yeah. gets better over time. You get more practice. And I looked at it and said, I love this. This blows my mind. Yeah, I also think yeah. I can do this. Like because like you know Klug's latest stuff. Right. It's, it's a different level. But it's like I looked at the early Klug and I was like, yeah, yeah, I can get there. And like it really made me want to delve into the craft and and see see what mm-hmm. what could be done, what I could do. That's very. That's that was very cool. special. Huh. That, I mean, we we're just about to the you know we're a little over an hour here, and I feel like we've only just scratched the surface of like altars. Like I thought we'd get through a lot more of what you have written down here, but there's just so much so much to it that I wasn't aware of. <laughs> now, that's kind of fun. Yeah. Now there's like there's a lot there's a lot of different kinds, and it's like I think we all have seen the stuff on Reddit that it's like a mm-hmm. it's a meme altar, which honestly those are fun too. Uh, like tons of respect for those, and sometimes. You know, those have more power impact, and it doesn't matter how much skill you put into it. If the idea mm-hmm. isn't there, the idea is not there. But altering is also, for me, and for I think a lot of people who do it very seriously, it's also an expression of love for the game, and love for community, and a way of um, in- enjoying your death yeah. much more. <laughs> you know, it's like, and I think for that reason, it, it made, I always thought, Especially after getting into old school, I felt like legacy players mm-hmm. kind of do mm-hmm. more of it, you know? <laughs> like, our decks are really special, and it's like, yeah, we have expensive cards that, like, maybe we understand that, like, if you if you need that for something mm-hmm. else, you sell that card and you buy something that is immediately yeah, yeah, relevant yeah. to your life. Yeah, yeah. Like, rock on. Like, you, you need a down payment, yeah. you can sell part of a deck or a deck, great, yep. you know, get your down payment. But... As long as you're playing with the cards, like mm. enjoy them, and like I think a lot of people are afraid about the the um, mm-hmm. comp REL situation, and I think it's reasonable, and I think it's incredibly important to say 
no altruist can guarantee right. that their altar will be legal. And so sure, fears yeah, are yeah. fully justified. Despite yeah. that, I say go for it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, yeah. just lean into your fear. It's like, get the cards that, you, that you're not too afraid yep. that, or that you can replace. Or the one, or get altruists who are mm-hmm. have a strong reputation or very experienced and can make the work really yeah. thin and, and beautiful. And it it'll get there's not there's nothing like the feeling of playing, like the feeling of when you have one card that fits just right. You got mm-hmm. those FBB mm-hmm. Japanese bolts, but imagine the feeling. It's like you got those. Right, no right. Super exactly unique. You know? your set, yeah, that's you know? that's really interesting. Hmm. So so tell me like what is what is like a has there have there has there been any card that you've always wanted to alter and you haven't gotten a chance to yet? Is there like a holy grail of like a card you want to get your hands on? <laughs> I mean for of me, course. Like, I yeah, yeah. Lotus. one day, you know, you know. Like like anyone, um and I I've had I've been talking with someone about it and I ha- I actually have a mm-hmm. mock up, it's pretty solid, but it's understandable. It's, thinking about it so we'll see i think that'll happen at, at some point but there are there are certain cards where um i just mm-hmm. love the card and i have really mm-hmm. good ideas for it it's like i want to do a, a port mm-hmm. a rashad and port because i think there are some really cool pieces one thing that i didn't i don't think i mentioned but it's probably just a feature of what i'm doing a lot i didn't a lot of what I do are classic art pieces. Mm-hmm. Not all of them. I said I think I mentioned uh, I mentioned Back to the Future and I mentioned you know a Studio Ghibli piece. But I do a lot of classical mm-hmm. paintings from every time period. I do Japanese woodblock prints. I've done Bronzino from the 15th century. And for me, um, I think there are a lot of really cool pieces in art history that will work super well hmm. in shot and port. So I hope at some point someone brings me some ports to work on because I ha- I've got an nice. idea for them. And one one thing that I learned from old school that's cool is a kind of altar where if you're if it's a card you're always going to play mm-hmm. as a playset, you can make an altar that extends over multiple right. cards and create right. a single picture. And like you know, pe- one version that's mm-hmm. the panorama. And there's also one where you put the it's kind of two and two and makes a larger rectangle the same proportion mm-hmm. as a card. And I've got some ideas for like a playset of ports oh, that cool. would be really cool. I did a playset of him, him to Turok that is this kind of like the black ball from Akira mm-hmm. destroying the city, and that is very satisfying. Especially you're casting them in the game, you get yeah, you get a couple yeah. of them going. Now, now, put all right. Let me ask you, let me ask you another question, and then we'll we'll probably wrap it up. What's your favorite him to Turok art? Which one do you think is the right him to Turok art? Because there's a right answer to this question. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Oh, oh yeah, for sure. This is this is the perfect place to end it. It's it's a it's it's a real sweat. You know, I gotta say, I'll tell you my my current answer is not my okay, childhood fair, answer. Okay, fair, fair. Um, I actually I have. <laughs> this is such a hedge. My current favorite is the is the uh, Quentin Hoover weird okay, wizard yep. guy, which as a kid I just didn't. It wasn't memorable. Yeah. I didn't care about it. As a kid, like the one everyone remembers, is the wolf, which is incredible. I I actually I bought a T-shirt from someone on the old school Discord of someone who printed the the wolf the him to Turok wolf art on a T-shirt. <laughs> it's like perfect to have the wolf T-shirt. That's as amazing. A t-shirt. And there's a very early clue altar that is him to Turok as a wolf T-shirt, but yeah. it's super early clue. Like the skill level is like you wouldn't think it's clue, but the, but it's an That's amazing. All, yeah, of art. course. You know, it's like really good. But when I was a kid, my favorite was the weird circle one. Oh, okay, yeah, where they're around the table or whatever. <laughs> I, yeah, I know. I, I, I don't know. Like, the, here I am skirting around the obvious wolf <laughs> question. But it, the, the Quentin Hoover art really yeah. grew on me yeah. over time. And, you know, these some a lot of these early magic artists, are, mm-hmm. I really respect their work. And it's like part of what drew you into the – I love mm-hmm. early magic art, and I love real-world yeah, flavor yeah. text. Like those, those are some of my feature like things that I yes, really yeah. love. Yeah, I'm not. I don't love like a lot of the new flavor text. It seems a little, um, uh, what's the word? I I feel like the real world world flavor text is effortless in in a really beautiful way. Yeah, and it feels like everything else. Well, not not I shouldn't say everything else, but the stuff that really sticks out in my mind of the flavor text that people are actually creating is a little bit, um, uh. Like they, it tries a little too hard. Does you, do you know what I'm saying? Like just, just that's that's yeah. the feel I get. Yeah, try, try, um, yeah, 
Yeah, exactly. I think that's the yeah, perfect so. way to put it. It's a little yeah, hard and, I, and it's like, not to oh, insult that's... the people who make it because yeah. I know there's people who like that's their actual job or or part of their job is is create flavor text. Yeah, but they are they are competing with like classic literary works. You know what I mean? Like so, so they have a tall or yeah. they they have they have big shoes to fill. I guess you know. I mean, some, like, I think probably the greatest flavor text in Magic is not a real world flavor text. It's like I think Rancor. <laughs> You know, hatred. Yeah, that is a pretty good one. Is that is just, pretty good. It's like kind of perfect. And it's like me coming from Urza Block. Of course, I've got a of bias, course. But like, I don't know. Like learning about Samuel Taylor Coleridge on all of these like fifth mm-hmm. edition cards mm-hmm. just blew mm-hmm. my mind. I also, I also love the 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 flavor text that stretch over multiple cards. Uh, there's one. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Oh jeez. There's one about goblins. I can't remember what cards they are, but there's one about go- like uh like it's like a decreasing number of goblins, like 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 a kid's nursery rhyme basically. It's pretty funny. Um, I think those are all, always interesting too, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, there it, it, some of some of the fun some of the fun has been is has been lost I think over the years. Uh, some of the silliness, the you know the tongue in cheek stuff, we don't get as much of it anymore. I think they should I think they should go back to that because that stuff is really fun to me, you know. Oh, um, sure. All right. Well, we got we, we went a, a, like I said, we only scratched the surface of the altar stuff, and I feel <laughs> I wish I could keep going on. Um, but we're probably going to leave it off here. But before we do, um, if someone yeah. wanted to get a hold of you, I know you said you have a, quite a few altars that you're working on. But if they wanted to get a hold of you and see either you know kind of like the your, the work you've done, or maybe even commission a piece from you in the future, where would, where would be the best way to do that? I'm on just the the usual suspects of mm-hmm. social media, Facebook, Instagram. I recently joined Twitter. I, to be honest, I barely understand how to use it. So, <laughs> excuse my presence on that platform. But I think um, Facebook and Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And I I try to post my pieces mm-hmm. when I make them. And um, on Instagram, sometimes I post a little bit. Um, longer reflections mm-hmm. on the work but in general it's it's on all of those and i try and share try and share the work and every like i think every five or ten pieces i'll share like mm-hmm. before and after pictures because sometimes the transformations mm-hmm. are really intense so it's kind of fun to sh- to show people it's like oh i posted this car but this is what it looked like this is this is yeah. how it changed and kind of see them in a group shows the variety of what's possible, which I enjoy. That's super cool. That's super cool. Um, all right. Well, before we get out of here, we'll do uh, we'll do scoops in the top eight. And every week, you know, we we try to shout out someone in the community, or I don't know, something fun, or whatever the case is. Could be magic related, non magic related. But uh, who do you want to <laughs> scoop in the top eight this week? All right. Well, this one, this one, I've got one for sure. Where it's like the the person and the game store that like really got me. Not just back into Magic, but specifically mm-hmm. into Legacy. I want to shout out Lori Saul at Nightwear in Los Angeles. I'm in I'm in yep. Massachusetts now, but when I got when I got into Legacy, Nightwear and Lori. I mean, it was dangerous. <laughs> like you go there, she lent she lends out I don't know 14 wow. Legacy decks. That's amazing. Yeah. Not proxies. For running running Legacy F and M mm-hmm. for years. And, she, and running great legacy tournaments for for many years, the the prizes were dual lands. I don't know if that's possible <laughs> in today's situation. Like she was still running for dual lands wow. before COVID, but it's you know it's yeah, been a crazy yeah. year. But she she really has an incredible store and an incredible personality. And I just the community of everyone who plays there is really amazing. Really, really great players. Um, and. Uh, I appreciate them. They're, they are uh, they are my LGS, and I guess I'll shout out Turn Zero Games in Los Angeles, which was my my nice. other LGS. I live a little close to them and played a lot of modern EDH there when I mm-hmm. when I did those things, and I really uh, really appreciated the people there and what they did. And I'm in Massachusetts now. I haven't been able to get an LGS because I moved. Yeah, jeez. But Tough I, timing. I hope to. Tough uh, timing. I, I really look forward to doing. Yeah, that in the that'd future. be awesome. That'd be awesome. And like you know, we have the. Uh, the LAL Opens will be coming back as soon as we get the all clear from gaming, etc. So uh, if you're into driving out a little bit towards Boston, uh, that you'll always be welcome there. It'll be a good time. Oh, easily, I I, I will be definitely awesome. be there. Probably playing some incredibly medium <laughs> deck. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, I'm just gonna shout out. I'm gonna scoop in the top eight. Uh, our friends over at the Legacy Pit. 
Uh, I know I mentioned them in the uh, in the pre-show. Um, Travis and all those guys. Um, they, they they said they have a big announcement this week, so check it out. I'm excited to see what it is. He told me I can't guess. When he when he sent me a message, so I'm not gonna guess what it is. Uh, but he says it's it's a, it's a major deal, so I'm super excited for them. And uh, they just do such a good job of keeping Legacy alive in some really trying times. They've done all the right things, and uh, and they're very passionate about it. And they seem to have a pretty great following. So shout out to them. Scoop scoop them into top eight. Uh, Travis and all the guys there. And uh, and yeah, I guess I guess that wraps us up for this week. Thank you very much for coming on, man. It was great to talk to you and. Uh, and I look forward to to seeing. I'm gonna check you out on Facebook and see some of the work that you've done because, yeah, alters something that's always interested me. But I've always been a little like uh, skittish because, for me, my my decks have to be a certain amount of liquid for me to justify having them. But like, yeah, but <laughs> yeah, I've never really thought sure. about like you know maybe like <laughs> maybe some of my Delvers we could you know I could alter I could alter them because they're I'm never gonna sell them you know they're, they'll always be somewhere in my collection. So, uh, yeah, that's really awesome, man. Thank you very much for taking the time and coming on and. Uh, and yeah, hope to see. Hope we get to see you soon in the LAL Open for sure. Absolutely, awesome. Thank all right, you. well, guys, thanks very much for uh, hanging out this week, and uh, we'll catch you all next week. And hopefully, hopefully, Jerry's back with us then. Hopefully, he's feeling better. <laughs> <laughs>